I'm Carolyn Ridpath, and I'm a member of the Montpelier Homelessness Task Force. And we have several people here from that task force. Tori and Nat, thank you for coming. And tonight I have with me Colby Lynch and Matthew Whalen. There are many, they are here to put more of a face on the many people in our area who are currently unhoused. In November 2022, Paige Gurton and I, with the support from the Homelessness Task Force, organized a presentation on the root causes of homelessness. Beth Burgess presented a study that she and others carried out under the auspices of what is now named the Washington County Homeless Coalition. The results of the study were based on a series of interviews with uh, people living in motels under the state's transitional housing program. These interviews provided important insights about the broad range of reasons why people become unhoused. The main causes reported were almost one third of the people interviewed said they lost housing due to lack of money or losing their job. Over one fifth of the interviews, the viewees became homeless as a result of divorce or a breakup, another form of economic hardship for many. Nearly a fifth linked their loss of secure housing to substance use. A number of these men and women had cycled through rehab several times. Most were in recovery, but had not used for years. Nearly one in seven lost housing due to consequences of being injured or having a physical health condition. Underlying much of this trauma is trauma, both in early life and as a result of being unhoused. Today, we will consider a broader spectrum of people who are currently unhoused, not just those who qualify for the state's transitional housing program. The majority of these people are being te housed temporarily in motels, but there are others who are sleeping in cars, outside, or couch surfing. In the Barry Montpelier area, there are currently approximately 450 people in the motels and shelters, many of whom will be exited in the coming months due to an end to the pandemic era federal funding. It is difficult to count the number of people outside, but it's estimated there are about 20 in our area. Those numbers are certain to increase as people exit motels and the weather turns warmer. As a community, we need to determine how we will aid, support, and provide temporary prote protection for these people. Permanent housing will be a responsibility for many, excuse me, will be a possibility for many, but it will be years before that need is met. Colby will describe how a variety of these causal factors resulted in her living in a motel unit with her partner. Her trajectory included job loss, economics, and ultimately a dearth of affordable housing. Matt will explore the role of trauma and substance abuse in leading to folks living on the street in Brattleboro. We hope that by listening to these two presentations, you will come to understand that every person who has become unhoused has their own unique story. What they all have in common is that they do not have permanent, safe, and affordable housing. And at present, there is little hope of obtaining it. There is a need for all kinds of shelter and support, ranging from temporary shelters like Good Samaritan's Three Shelters in Barrie in Berlin and the Overflow Shelter in Montpelier to a variety of more permanent low income and or low barrier housing possibilities, including the proposed Habitat for Humanity project on Northfield Street and the Country Club Road site 
both of which are seeking public input and involvement. Now I'd like to present our speakers. I'm going to start with Colby. Hi, my name's Colby Lynch. Um, for any of you guys that picked up one of these, Metamorphosis in Reverse, feel free to read along with what I have to say. Um, on, the f on the cover of this right here um, are some blurbs from the Bridge article that was printed, um, Homeless in a Housing Shortage, and featuring mine and my partner's situation. And I've started this out with, right here, shows a picture of Vermont. It says, housing is community. In American society, we, we consider abject houselessness as a lack of shelter, not as the breakdown, breakdown of community that it actually is. Housing is commodity. Housing, housing has been, become a commodity rather than the basic human right that it actually is. My vulnerability is betrayed by my courage and drive to change things right here at home. So I'm going to start off with a poem, and I, I named this poem Metamorphosis in Reverse. So this basically encompasses the way I feel about living in the motel. Trading shells for wings, indeed there's such a thing. It's easy to fly when there is a stiff wind blowing down the mountain, great ideas from up above flowing like a fountain. Everything seems possible when the sails open up and bloom, Ride those vectors, turn that tide, up here there's plenty of room. See the whole big picture, succeed and thrive and grow. Up above unlimited, bird's eye view of down below. Those winds don't come, no waters run, is when it gets quite scary. Troubles arise and burdens appear that are far too much to carry. Here we are, stationary and stagnant, hope seems so far away. You wonder why this happened and question how you, will, how you will face today. You get stuck, you're out of luck, muster just a little pluck, try to keep your spirits up, but deep inside realize your F word. Time marches on and on and on and you become despondent, reactive, guarded, knowing well it's nothing that you did that got this whole thing started. All your efforts to fly and breathe and open up your perception does not compute your voice's mute antenna without reception. The shell you've been given seems a refuge, but only for a minute. Free to roam and do as you please, but pent up while you're in it. Goals unlikely to be met, reversing now, butterfly effect. Time's running out, you've got no clout. This isn't what you're all about. This can't be true, this is not you. The voices seem to scream. When I'm in the shell, that's where I dwell, somewhere in between. Resourcefulness and patience have become my closest friends in this nowhere land of limbo that never seems to end. Speaking, seeking to speak and breathe again, somewhere safe and sound, so here I go, my legs are found, stretching them gently on the ground. Innocence lost is wisdom bound. So next I'm gonna read the testimony that I read to the House General in Housing and House Human Services. It was um, for the homeless, Homelessness Awareness Day in January up at the State House. And it was on January 19, 2023. My name is Colby Lynch and I currently live at the Quality Inn in Barrie. First, I'd like to give a bit of background information on how exactly my partner and I found ourselves living in a hotel room. When the pandemic began, we were both home care providers. Tyler had been working with an agency out of Moortown for over a decade. He was great at the job of caregiving and I was relatively new, though my background as a single parent prepared me well. All was going smoothly with work, however, our living situation became a precarious one. The owner of the house we were renting to the tune of $1,600 per month had plans to sell the property and needed to fix it up. I was hoping that we could continue staying there through this transition, but that was not the case. We had been given a notice to vacate within three months. At the time, we didn't really think it was that big of a deal other than the arduous task of moving our belongings during mud season. We secured a room through Front Porch Forum and moved in at the beginning of May 2021. 
Despite our desire to make the living situation work, we recognized that we had to, we had to leave what had become an unhealthy living situation. By that time, it was the height of the housing crisis and there were no options available, no matter how much money you made. So we found ourselves living in our van. When you are living in a vehicle and the temperatures are getting down to 28 degrees, it is a life-changing experience, one I still have not fully recovered from. We moved into a hotel room on November 4th, 2021. We were just glad to be somewhere warm and not living in our vehicles. But I want to stress the reality that motel rooms are for vacations or weekend excursions, not everyday life. For example, I am grateful for the lady who reached out when I posted our story on the Hunger Mountain Co-op Community Board. She allowed me to use her camp stove so I could boil some water and correctly put away my garden goods for the winter. I used to take pride in the ability to grow food and can it properly. When I had a kitchen, I was quite the entertainer with elaborate meals that were the outcome of my garden growing ventures. I don't get to entertain much these days. In the motel room, we have a microwave and a one pot coffee maker. The set of drawers to keep our clothing in were all busted before we moved in. I keep my clothing in the armoire and in laundry baskets stacked on top of each other. It is quite the ordeal to put together a simple matching outfit sometimes. These days, I work with the public waiting tables and bartending. Wearing dirty, ill-fitting, or damaged clothes is not a good look when you have this sort of job. I could go on, but my main message is this. If there were housing units available, then we would be in one right now. Vermont has no housing safety net. We had to switch careers because if we made even $60 more than we currently make at low-wage jobs, we would not be able to stay at the hotel. But this is a chicken and egg situation. Even if we find housing, we have to show that we can afford it. But we can't secure more lucrative income sources because if we do, we are kicked out of our current situation and would be homeless again. We see signs that everywhere is hiring, but having no homes available to rent is impacting folks' ability to apply for these jobs. If this great need for unavailable housing persists, Vermont will lose a lot of good workers. It is comforting to know that there are those who hold public office that do truly care. That being said, I shouldn't have to feel like I'm violating community standards just by simply existing. These days, the weariness of the situation has my spirit straining rapidly. I know that I'm physically and mentally a strong individual, capable of a lot of good. I'm a mother to a grown boy, a visionary artist, and a worthy confidant. I enjoy a good laugh, even at the expense of myself. But having no place to live is no laughing matter. The debasing stereotypes towards a homeless need to be eradicated from public dissent. Perhaps the day will come when I can look back and chuckle at the desperation behind emptying my middle-aged bladder in a Fahe yogurt container in the dead of the early morning, freezing my behind off in the car because the water pump in the van went out again or waiting in anticipation for the dreaded cop knock on the van window, assaulting my precious sleep just to make sure, quote unquote, everything is okay. A day will come when I'm able to stretch out on my own couch again, or have access to a table to do my art in my own space, or cook in my own kitchen so I can entertain friends and family at my dinner table. A situation such as this can be debasing and destabilizing. I am thankful that I can choose for it not to be demoralizing. I have made a few friends at the motel. Grit and candor, and I like to think wisdom has pulled me through this experience thus far. I only wish to use my testimony as a way of addressing the issues, acting, and moving forward. The words of Eleanor Roosevelt have become clear to me in these chaotic times. No one can make you feel inferior without your consent. I will end on this note. Thank you. That was a false ending, by the way. I actually have more. Um, <laughs> that that was. I like the applause, though. Um, that was what I read for the for the big wigs up at the state house. So that was that. That was in a like an abbreviated edition of a lot that's in this. So if you guys are interested in the full unedited version of the story. This is a timeline of exactly how we became homeless, my partner and I. And to back it up a bit, 
When I moved to Vermont five years ago, we lived in Montpelier. I used to work at the Uncommon Market right up the street. I'm really familiar with the area. Being in Barrie's been an adjustment um, because in that, those other years, we were living out in Brookfield at that house that I was talking about that was $1,600 a month. Um, but I can say that regarding the living situation, as challenging as it was sometimes working with people that had brain injuries and autism and just different things, that could be a challenge, but I felt a lot more secure those days regarding you know, where we were gonna exist. So um, anyway, I wanted to point to this because I had him put it up on the board. Um, I came up with this little upside down um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs for anybody that's studied psychology that's familiar with that. Well, this is the inverted hierarchy of needs because when you lose your place to live, you gotta start down at the bottom. So the bottom of the little pyramid says reason to be why one gets out of bed in the morning instead of giving up and doing nothing. And I'll tell you right now, I see a lot of people that give up and do nothing. And it's, it's horrible, you know, and it, it just is, it's a hopelessness that just kind of sucks you in and takes you over. I'm a fighter. I've always been a fighter. I lift weights, I run. I'm not tooting my own horn, but I'm saying I keep my body in good physical condition. And a lot of that reason is because I know when the time does come for the next phase of this whole story, I want to be able to move my belongings and not have to like hire someone and pay them to help me with it. Um, I don't know if we, oh, we're trying to get that back on. Okay, so up from, okay. <laughs> These freeze don't move. <laughs> All right, so, um, up from the reason to be, I'll just read it off from here, um, is a will to live, which is having the confidence and bravery to act upon one's reason to existing. So reason to be, you found your purpose. Next up the ladder is will to live. You want to keep going. Next one up the ladder, and I had to do this when I started working at the bowling alley because obviously it's impossible to be a homeless home care provider. So I wasn't really planning on going back to waiting tables, but I saw that as something that I enjoy doing. I ended up working at the bowling alley in, in Berlin, and um, I really love my crew there and good, good people. So the next one on the pyramid's network of influence, a sufficient network of family, friends, coworkers, and social connection to act efficaciously. So that's basically saying, you know you, someone's got your back. You know, I, I go to work, I do my job, we can call, you know, call out, call each other in, you know, we're on that network. Doesn't mean that I can move in with them because a lot of people are going through the same kind of thing. They're, they're working two or, two or three jobs in some cases just to keep the roof that they have over their head. The next one's important to me, it's predictable environment. With the motel program running out, and right now we don't know when that's gonna be, my predictable environment could change like that again. And that's why I said metamorphosis, metamorphosis in reverse, because as it stands right now, and we, we still haven't found an apartment, um, we could be living in the vehicles again. So my predictable environment has gone up and down like that. My constant steady has been maintaining a job, Staying true to myself, um, you know, through writing this, this has been very cathartic to me, getting this out, speaking out, sharing it with people. Because when this all first happened, I was hitting the panic button and I was doing the why. I was doing the, oh my God, I've never been through anything like this before. And then I went through the anger, we didn't do anything wrong, how could this happen, you know? And all of that was counterproductive. All of that was eating at me and I just, I threw it all away and I said, no, we're gonna focus on how we're gonna fix this. So after the predictable environment, satisfaction of physiological needs. So basically for me, I've got a place to take a shower, I've got food, I mean, I write about it in here, um, even keeping food in a little fr fridge, like the size of a bar fridge, it's like a dorm room fridge. You put stuff in there, it's gonna ice up the fridge, it's gonna ruin your food. So I drive around with a cooler in my car. 
I get the ice for free for my job, and that's how I eat healthy because all that other, all that stuff that, you know, I mean, you know, you eat too much bread, you eat too much salt, I know what it does. It, it changes your moods. Um, in, in the past, I've had some unhealthy living choices, but when all this started happening, I started buckling down and saying, I got to take care of me. I don't have anything to fall back on now. God knows I'm not getting any younger. I'm 48 years old. Um, so up there, right there, says, enjoying the luxury of a good night's rest, comfortable clothing, adequate shelter, clean air and water, and a good meal. And I think that's really what people want, you know? When you don't have some of that stuff, like when we were, when we were living in the van for three weeks, and I'll give the backstory briefly about that. After we had left that $1,600 a month place because the guy was going to fix it up, we ended up at this other place. And when I outlined that unhealthy living situation, there was mold there. They, they, there was a time when we couldn't cook any meals because the, fr the stove broke and it was a fire hazard. Like when you turn it on, it would go tick, 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 and then poof, it sounded like it would blow up. It was a gas stove. So a few other tenants moved in and I warned them about the situation. I said, I don't really use the oven because it's a fire hazard and the landlord wasn't doing anything about it. So when the landlord, you know, got a whiff of the fact that I wasn't putting up with it. She was kind of on eggshells. And then finally she said, I'm giving you guys 60 day. It was a verbal notice. And I was just like, okay, you understand. We work with disabled people. We got nowhere to go. And she said, well, my daughter needs your bedroom. So I said, okay, well, I guess we're going to live in the van is what I said, because that was what ended up really happening. But when I tried to get help through the state, it wasn't a slam dunk. There was this, they were asking me for written eviction notices. And I said, we don't have anything like that. It was a verbal notice. So after that, while we were homeless, I'm going to read this part right here because you're going to hear the desperation in my voice on this one. Um, and this was, written to the Herald newspaper that's over in Randolph. And um, I said, dear editors, and they actually printed my homeless and living in a van story. I'm writing to you today to raise awareness in the, to the issue, issue of homelessness in Vermont. I can't say that I've ever been in this position before. So if I skip around, please excuse the chaos. Attaches the experience that my boyfriend and I have been through that led to us staying in our van in a parking lot. It is not drugs or mental, mental illness or other issues that everyday people may assume. The conundrum is that I've looked into getting help, getting help to get us back into a roof over our heads and the struggle has been difficult. For the last few months, I have been following the outcomes of the Vermont State House decisions regarding the hotel voucher program being extended. A lot of the folks receiving the vouchers have been receiving help since COVID-19 gripped <coughs> communities worldwide. Governor Scott's decision to end the voucher program was equated to the game of kick the can recently in a local newspaper editorial. It appears to me at this time that individuals need to be elderly, have dependent children, or one on the way, disabled, or in the mental health system in order to receive a hand up while they are houseless. I am an able-bodied, and I put able-bodied in quotes because when it's getting down to 28 degrees and you're in a vehicle, I'm not, I'm not bare grills. I'm going to get cold. I'm going to be freaking out. And um, I just put that out there. My son is growing, grown and on his own. I work a full-time job providing a vocational program for a disabled person through gardening. That's what I was doing at the time. At this time, I should be focusing my efforts on the greenhouse project that is in store for our agency this winter. In my free time, I have been bringing awareness to the homeless issue in Vermont. It is going to get cold soon, and living outside in parking lots could be fatal to some folks, even able-bodied ones. I have noticed that there are community drives going on to obtain supplies such as tents, warm clothes, etc., for those living outdoors. This is helpful, and the intention behind it's in the right place, but right now we need active community action and advocacy. Some of us, myself included, need better options than a nod at the situation and identification that there's a housing crisis going on here. Basic shelter is a human right, and quite frankly, it scares me when I consider that my boyfriend and I could wind up statistics frozen in a van in a parking lot and put um, exclamation point. We are doing our best right now to fix our situation. 
I am aware that the rental market is scarce right now and I've called around to different agencies in the area such as Capstone Community Services, the Economic Services Division, and looked into the VRAPS program for relocation. In closing, I thank you for your time in reading about our experience. I have attached currently living in a van. If so inclined, you may edit it for publication. So it was basically when I was working with my person and doing the guarding, I didn't quit my job. I just couldn't do the job anymore because we didn't have anywhere to live. But also because it was a $60, you know, I might make $60 too much one paycheck and then we're going to be out in the van again. So I was like, okay, I got to think outside the box here and get another job. And that's a job that I currently have. But I wrote, I was writing stuff down, and this little thing I picked up at the Barry Library, it says Washington County Survivor's Guide, and it's got a bunch of tips on self-care, the community meals, that kind of stuff. Um, and I just wrote stuff on here. That's why I came up with metamorphosis in reverse. I wrote down race to the bottom because that's what it feels like is going on with us, you know, in the motel program running out. And... Um, I wrote down seen, seen in a different light through another lens, meaning that in this situation, I see this whole, this whole thing that's homelessness through a different light because it's my lens. Um, those two pieces that are on that table is what I do in my free time. I make art. Those are, um, that's actually bar glass that I turned into pieces. It's polymer clay on glass with a resin cast. And these things that I make, I cut up clay on the side of the tub because I really look for any flat surface. And he's got his computer on, on our little desk thing. So I'm very creative about making create, creative things. In the past, I used to make these big elaborate lanterns. And they call me the Beacons Light Art Lantern Lady. And I'm still a lantern lady, but right now I feel like I'm not working to my full capacity because I don't have space to, to create like I used to. So if you ask me how I feel right now, when I wrote Race to the Bottom here, um, I was thinking of it in an analogy of I've heard from a lot of people, yeah, you, you came into this motel thing at the worst, the crisis couldn't have been worse. It was like a total perfect storm for you guys. And I'm like, yeah, I realize this. It, it kind of felt like... <laughs> If you were on a greased, if you can imagine this, because I do, I have a lot of visual images. That's why I'm an artist. But like, you have a greased ladder, you're trying to climb up, and it's getting colder and colder as you're getting up. Your hands start to freeze, and you're losing, and you keep falling. And when you keep falling, you keep hitting your head. <laughs> you know, when you're like, this didn't work, try it again, and then finally the ladder just disappears, and then you're at the bottom, and then you're just like, all right, let's go back to what we were doing a year and a half ago because. I don't know what else to do. So right now, at this point in time, I'm really hoping to make an, or I call an organic connection um, with somebody that will have a place for us. Because um, I've, like I've said, I've, I've had all the emails out there. I've called the numbers. I've just, I had a few people just, you know, the last one I talked to that was a prospective, um, you know, landlord said something that it, it was a red flag. Something I said to him was a red flag as a landlord because I was talking about the mold in the last place. And I, I was just like, I'm just, I, I didn't even know what to say. I was stunned. And I'm like, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. That's why it didn't work out. We were asked to leave. We didn't get evicted. We didn't not pay our rent. We just had to leave, you know. And um, I think sometimes people try to put fault where there isn't any, I guess, but I don't know. We just want somebody to give us a chance at this point, and um, yeah, that, that's where I'm at, but if you'd ask me if I feel like I'm hopeless, no, I do not. Some days I do, and some days I have to, like, pull myself out of it, just say, okay, right now I can't look at anything native. I don't watch the news that too much, unless it's something local, because I think it's important. I want to stay here. My partner wants to stay here. We love Vermont. He's been here longer than I have. He's been here over, over 10 years. Um, we did the long-distance relationship for a while when my son was growing up over to the other border, New Hampshire. But um, I think I'll share the time, so... Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks, Colby. That was really good. Um,
That was a really powerful testimony. I had not seen that before. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for inviting me, Carolyn. Um, uh, I'm very glad to be here, and it's always encouraging, particularly in such isolating times, to meet and be among people. Uh, yes. Uh, it's always encouraging, particularly in such isolating times, to meet uh, and be among people gathering to understand and work together on these problems. Um, I <clears throat> wrote this basically keeping to sort of two uh, parts. The first part on the what you've called in the past the root causes of homelessness and the second part on basically what we can do about it. Um, there's obviously no simple or single answer to this. Many factors are at play. It's worth noting that increases in homelessness nationally began, began in the years, and I think specifically the year right before COVID-19. Uh, so it is a little <coughs> difficult to know exactly what was causing the rise in homelessness uh, nationally before the pandemic happened. Um, but I think it goes without saying that there's no single cause of homelessness and that each case of homelessness or housing insecurity is usually caused and perpetuated by multiple interacting and overlapping factors. Um, to give some background on my work and how I became interested in this topic may be helpful. Uh, for the past six or seven years, uh, I've been writing oral history and journalism. For the most part, my work focuses on homelessness and imprisonment uh, in America. Uh, in both places, uh, sorry, in both cases, my goal is to place those directly experiencing the issue at the center of my work, to have their voices and experiences tell the stories rather than my own or experts. Um, one reason I became interested in the subject of homelessness and felt I could contribute something to the discussion about it uh, was that for a couple of years in Brattleboro, uh, where I was living and still live, uh, there was a great deal of debate and controversy in local government, local news media, among business owners, police, and other well-to-do segments of the community about different problems caused by the presence of homeless people in town. News articles began appearing regularly about locals who feel uncomfortable with poor people asking for money on the street, Locals who, f who feel the presence of homeless people or panhandlers is bad for business. Other lo uh, locals nervous about a winter homeless shelter being moved to a location that is too close to other things where people who are not homeless hang out. Um, the tension of this topic and the stream of coverage about it seemed to coincide with the closing of a place in, uh, called The Wall in Brattleboro. The wall was a long alleyway, privately owned by someone who was just a tolerant person, knew people in the community, uh, where homeless people could congr would congregate, spend time together, unwind, even sleep. Uh, the wall was closed down after an overdose there, an overdose death there, prompting the homeless to spread out all over town each day, and non-homeless locals to have to see more homeless people in more places throughout the day. For years, in all of these local newspaper articles, and there were many of them, uh, select board meetings, town meetings, meetings of local business owners, and more, homeless people were not in attendance at the discussions about them, nor were they sought out. Uh, strikingly, they were also not quoted or sought out for interviews in any of the news articles about them throughout this couple year long stretch before the pandemic, in which the local press was focusing on stories about their lives. Uh, in one case, um, one of the main papers, I won't name it, but you can probably guess, uh, even published a story pertaining to homelessness with a picture on the cover that they went all the way into downtown to take of a homeless man drinking a beer in public. And in the article that the picture was for, they did not quote the man they'd taken a picture of or any other homeless people. They interviewed and quoted a handful of locals, business owners, select board members, cops, usual suspects who are not homeless, took a picture of a homeless person and interviewed no homeless people for that story on homelessness. Uh, having known and been close to many people experiencing homelessness and poverty in town over the years, 
along with having a growing interest in the craft of oral history writing, I felt I had an opportunity to help tip this imbalance in whose voices and experiences were highlighted in the literature, news, and discourse on homelessness in, in the town. Over the last few years, I've conducted hundreds of interviews, uh, extensive interviews with homeless people and prisoners in America. Uh, my most important job, and I would argue the most important job of any writing, and one of the most important skills in life generally, I think, is listening. Listening to the life stories of the sources who are experiencing the issues directly and getting to know them largely created the perspective I bring to this talk today. Um, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to get into the subject of the root causes of homelessness by touching a, a bit on what generally are not the root causes of homelessness, because that um, came up a lot when I was getting involved in the work. One narrative about the causes of homelessness that I found to be common among people who are not homeless, from former select board members to small business owners to locals I'd find myself next to at the bar or coffee shop, is that people choose to be homeless. That the majority of homeless people on the streets of Brattleboro live outside because they prefer to or don't have a home because they don't want one. Other variations of this theory went so far as to claim that the people asking for money on the streets of Brattleboro, so-called panhandlers, were pretending to be homeless, that many of them actually had homes, that they were making hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars a day asking for money on the street. Um, I know it's, it's not, um, um, it's not perhaps, I, I, I was surprised and I remain surprised over the years by the prevalence of these beliefs because of frankly how outlandish they seem. Um, uh, uh, for one of my books, I even tried to seek out people who panhandle even though they have a home. Uh, I was able to find only one, and if there's time at, at the end, I'd be happy to discuss his situation, what it was like to interview him. But even there, it's not like he was uh, pretending to be homeless. He was still not in a good living situation. Um, in any event, uh, particularly in a more or less liberal town, in which locals generally seem otherwise well-informed and consider themselves tolerant of others, uh, I have been surprised by how widespread and normalized such borderline conspiracy theories uh, presented without evidence have become and how openly bigoted they seem toward the poor. Similarly, I'm also surprised that the local newspaper wrote story on, after story on subjects pertaining to homelessness, uh, homeless life in town without thinking to interview homeless people to quote in those stories. Would they do this if they were writing stories about any other group of people? <clears throat> in my experience working with homeless people and getting to know them, I have found no credibility in these choice-based uh, theories about uh, why people become homeless. Others assume that the homeless are primarily drug addicted or mentally ill, However, rather than the assumed addiction or mental illness causing compassion or empathy, the reverse often happens. Homeless people, uh, homeless people are painted and seen as inherently less trustworthy because it is assumed they are mentally ill or drug, or drug addicted. Strikingly, many people are quicker to assume that homeless people are drug addicted or mentally ill, mentally Ill than they are to assume that homeless people are poor. And the homeless are often seen as responsible for their addiction for not getting help, for not getting a job, etc. A contradiction arises. There's an undertone to attitudes that attribute homelessness to choice, suggesting that people are homeless in some way deserve to be homeless. An attitude uh, ironically often held by the very sa same people who feel the most uncomfortable and threatened by encountering homeless people out on the street. Often the people who do not believe in free housing uh, and, uh, and more housing, uh, for the poor and homeless, for example, are the same people who complain the most about encountering them in the street. In my experience, the belief in one form or another that people end up homeless or panhandling simply by some form of a choice 
which is probably an appealing belief precisely because it is the simplest explanation, is in fact so abstract and philosophical that it is not helpful to the discussion. In very few instances is it possible to identify a moment in which a person made a choice to become homeless on his or her journey. But more importantly, even in the rare instances in which we can identify the moment in which a person chose in some way to be homeless, that knowledge all by itself that such a choice was made offers little to nothing in the way of explaining the cause of their homelessness. The choice explanation does not contribute to the conversation about why people become homeless. It is a way to shut that conversation down. Um, narratives that take place, uh, that's something I'd be happy to elaborate more on the Q&A too. Narratives that, take, uh, narratives that place the cause of homelessness squarely on personal responsibility typically cause people to be afraid of homeless people, which leads to calls for more, po calls for more policing rather than more housing or other services. And more policing makes the problem of homelessness worse. In Brattleboro, for example, funding has increased to the police in recent years and crime has gone up anyways. Some causes of homelessness will continue to cause homelessness unless they are dealt with. Currently, these causes are not being dealt with. For example, many years, the number one cause of personal bankruptcy is medical debt, though bank personal bankruptcy and homelessness are not necessarily the same. Personal bankruptcy doesn't always lead to homelessness necessarily. The cost of housing and rent uh, is sky high and wages have not kept up with productivity or the cost of living since the late 1970s. Furthermore, recent studies have shown that a majority of people who were homeless last year also worked, meaning that in America, the richest nation in the history of the world, you can work and still end up homeless. Keep this in mind next time you see someone yell, get a job at a person asking for money on the street. Seen that way, it's easier to understand why some homeless people who don't work don't simply get a job. Why bother? In many instances, getting a job barely helps at all and you'll end up homeless anyways. Factors like these, people spending all their money on rent or health care while they are not making enough at work, are basic problems that will continue to cause homelessness unless they are solved in my opinion. Many other causes of homelessness are complicated by the fact that they are also effects of homelessness. Unemployment, for example, can lead to homelessness, and homelessness can cause or exacerbate unemployment. The same is true of addiction and mental health issues. Being homeless can make you more likely to have more encounters with law enforcement and spend time in jail or prison, and encounters with law enforcement and spending time in jail or prison can also make you more likely to be homeless. This does not mean there's no answer to the question of what causes homelessness. Rather, there are many correct and often interacting answers for many different people. Some commonalities throughout the homeless population are notable. Childhood poverty and lack of opportunities beginning in childhood is perhaps one of the most important themes. Um, many people, men and women alike, have been physically abused in some way at some point before their homelessness. However, there are many exceptions to commonalities like these, and people of diverse economic backgrounds regularly become homeless. The main common theme, in my opinion, is bad luck. Going through an extended stretch of life, often right from the beginning, suffering one major loss after another, and ending up with no place to live or call home. Since we have common themes and many different, but often overlapping, useful answers to the causes and effects of homelessness, which again are often the same. One of the next questions in my mind becomes how to treat people who are homeless, both as a society and interpersonally in our individual day-to-day -day lives. Surprisingly, this was one of the main subjects of debate when the, subject, uh, when the topic of homelessness arose as it did several years ago in Brattleboro. Um, as you've gathered by now, I do not believe the narratives that make sense of homelessness by blaming the life choices of individual homeless people. Saying a homeless person uh, is homeless by choice or calling homeless, a homeless person asking for money in the street a panhandler is a little bit like calling a prisoner sedentary or indoorsy. Making assumptions about the personal choices of homeless people is neither accurate nor helpful in coming up with solutions on a broad scale. The question of what we can do about homelessness, in my view, is a two-pronged question, and the answer to the first part is simpler than the answer to the second part. 
The first question is how we treat homeless individuals in our community, interpersonally when we encounter them. If you became homeless, how would you want people to treat you? After all, it could happen to you. Your odds of becoming uh, homeless are a lot higher than um, people may think, about 1 in 200 in America, uh, with some adjustments made for uh, the economic background the person starts to have from. Um, the question of what we, uh, sorry, already. Um, uh, yeah, and if you are someone who feels offended, uncomfortable, or threatened by the presence of homeless people in your town, keep in mind that what you want is the same as what people want who are sympathetic to homeless people, not to see people living out on the street. The second part of the question is what we can do politically about the problem beyond the interpersonal and indi individual level, how we can organize to address the problem more broadly in society with the end goal being the near eradication or virtual eradication of homelessness. This becomes complicated because so many factors cause and perpetuate homelessness simultaneously that working to solve homelessness will often mean devoting ourselves to and advocating for and against issues that appear on the surface to be separate from homelessness but are deeply related, such as mass incarceration, health care, <coughs> me, a bloated military budget, to name a few. Um, so let's take the first question first, how we should treat homeless people we encounter at the individual level in day-to-day -day life. And in my opinion, the answer to that is rather simple. It's just to be kind, open to getting to know people, and to be non-judgmental. Uh, don't be any less open to interacting with, knowing, or being friends with those from, with those from lower economic backgrounds than yourself than you are with anyone else. <coughs> Uh, don't, do not make assumptions about how people who ask for money on the streets will spend that money or pass judgment on them based on assumptions about their spending habits. Do not assume that homeless people are dishonest or untrustworthy. Do not assume they're mentally ill. Do not assume they're drug addicted. Do not assume they prefer not to work. And if you discover any of these things to be true about any particular homeless person, do not assume that this adequately explains even that particular person's situation. Always assume it is more complicated, and it doesn't keep hurt to keep in mind that this could be you someday. Now to the second, more complicated question of what we can do politically more broadly to address the issue on a societal scale. There are no new or simple answers to this question. It is important to get together and organize. In politics, it is impossible to accomplish anything alone. Find people who are standing up to the problem, working on solutions, and helping people. <clears throat> Advocate together. The more homeless and formerly homeless people involved in and leading the organizing, the better. But it's important not to be entirely discouraged if organization among currently homeless people in particular is sometimes scarce. When the homeless cannot participate, it is the responsibility of those with relative privilege, resources, and time to do the organizing and take action. Uh, too often, those who want to help cannot, and those who can help do not want to. When it comes to homelessness, pressing for increased socioeconomic services that support the unhoused is important, and pressing for more uh, housing and more free and affordable housing is more important. However, again, if we are truly concerned with the root causes of homelessness, it is important to organize just as hard in local and national politics alike around issues that often do not appear on the surface to be directly related, but do cause and contribute to the problem of homelessness. As with every issue in our time, it is frustrating to try to act because it often feels nothing is getting done by our political elites to address any of the problems we care about, especially at the national level, except by making them worse. And because each problem we urgent, urgently care about is connected to other problems we care about that often nothing is also being done about. It is easy to get discouraged by the intractable nature of our political climate, but this intractability is precisely why we need more organizing more advocacy, more protest, more action taken by citizens on more issues. It is not a reason to give up. <clears throat> um, so 
I'll end that by saying often uh, in politics there is a battle of mobilization, getting together and organizing with people who share your concerns about the problem and your desire to get involved and, and desire to get involved in the str struggle. Gatherings like the one here tonight are a crucial part of that process. It's not always about changing minds. Often it is about getting people who already agree with the struggle to get involved in taking action, and this is perhaps the most crucial part of taking political action. Sometimes in politics, however, there is a battle of persuasion. On many issues, the divisions between Americans with different political beliefs run so deep that they're increasingly less likely to engage with each other in the battle of persuasion, preferring the battle of mobilization. We are less likely to engage with those who disagree with us. We might even find their views totally offensive. I'd like to say that there's no upside to abandoning the battle of persuasion and no downside to engaging it, even when our chances of convincing people are low. When we engage in the battle of persuasion, there's a small chance we will change mind, minds and a larger chance we won't, but there's no chance we will change minds if we do not engage. Worst case scenario, the person you're trying to convince will feel the same way they already did. Um, and I'll end by noting again that on the issue of homelessness specifically, there's at least one point of common ground among people who are made uncomfortable by seeing homeless people in the street and hold prejudiced views towards them, people who are sympathetic to the homeless community, and homeless people themselves. None of us want to see people living out on the street. My hope is that in addition to the mobilization of people who are sympathetic to the homeless, this commonality can also be the beginning of alliances even among people who disagree with each other, um, and often especially at the local level. Um, and I think I'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, and at this point, we'll open it up for questions. Um, observations, I saw a lot of people nodding their heads at various points. If you want to reinforce what was said, you'd like to speak? Uh, I'd like to speak up part of the good. Do I? Okay. I'm going to make it short and simple. <laughs> I've met a lot of you on these streets. I say good morning, whatever as I come to the library. I've been homeless for four years. I'm 70 years old. I'm a veteran. I did 23 years in the Vermont National Guard and I'm proud of it. I was living in Montpelier on Monsignor Crosby when the big flood came through town. I donated my boat. I watched everybody come together and work as a team and save the people's businesses and get people out and save their lives. I watched a car in the back of motor vehicle parking lot Brand new, guy jumped out of it, ran into motor vehicles, it tumbled into the river and went down the river. I saw that personally. Everybody in this town can work together. I used to drive school bus here for a number of years, for the middle school. For the young kids, I helped build a playground. Remember Noah's Ark? I was involved in that in the playground up here. I volunteered and a bunch of people that ran businesses in this area donated lumber and everything, including Allen Lumber Company. We built a playground for kids on a weekend. Everybody can work together and help the homeless. Yes, there's some bad homeless out there. I won't disagree. I'm alcohol and drug free, and I need a place to live. The reason I got homeless, I was living in a trail that was so full of black mold it made me sick. I had moved into a fifth wheel camper with my little dog and my poor dog. I he froze, he cuddled up in three quilts. I bought propane tanks, because it's the only thing I had was these 20 pound cylinders. I went through three loads a week with a Subaru, five tanks a piece, and paid dearly to get them filled. I had to take them into Hampshire, it was the cheapest place to buy fuel. Even insulating a camper. Campers are junk for insulation. Anybody that owns a fifth wheel will tell you the same thing, even the brand new ones. The insulation is about that thick. I had to move out of there. I sold that piece of land and just about gave it away because of the black mold trailer. I was building a tiny house up behind the trailer, which I made a deal with a guy that he would let me have it. Well, myself, I couldn't, I was so sick, I couldn't get everything moved off the property. He kept the tiny house. 
people from New York that bought an inn right in West Thompson Village at the church I was going to every weekend. This woman walked up because she had a good week and handed me $500 in cash and says, put some, an angel told me to give you this to put insulation into your tiny house. And I said, I will work my butt off to pay every back, every cent back, and I will. I used to go over and shovel her pathway around the end so people could get into it. We'd go there and have our get-togethers and everybody do potluck. Everybody knows what potluck is. Everybody eats together. So you know what I mean? That's what this place is about. Montpelier, I am proud of. A lot better than Barry. I've lived at the Budget Inn. I have lived at the one you lived at, which is the best motel in that area as far as I'm concerned. I lived at the No Motel. And from there, I went on the street because the vendor ran out. 30 below zero. This coat right here is a lot warmer than what I had on. I slept under bridges. And I did this. I walked the streets of Barry from Cullen Farms to Cullen Farms all night long. Just to keep warm so I wouldn't freeze to death. I had no choice. I'm not proud of it. But I'm a human being. It's like this old story from the church. Red and yellow, black and white, we're all the same. Indian, I'm mixed breed. I'm Abernathy Indian. I'm proud of it. I also got Irish, Scottish. I have an attitude problem sometimes, okay? But I'm a mixed breed, but I'm still a human being. Just like everybody, like the story I heard from you and from you, I've met and talked to a lot of homeless people. I, I smoke cigarettes. I passed out cigarettes right and left even if I was poor. If they needed money for coffee, I'd give it to them. I'd give my shirt off my back to a homeless person. I'll tell you why, because it's a human being. They all need help. Some of them, like he said, it could be drugs, it could be abuse. I've met women that have been so badly abused I've talked with them, a total stranger, wrote to Burlington and back with them and met them. I've walked up to a lot of people, and everyone I walk down Main Street or State Street because I do it for exercise, I say good morning. Some will say yes, welcome. And I'll say, oh, it's gonna be a good day. Today I walked around, I said, I ordered spring, it should be here shortly. And here we got a big snow storm coming. I've watched a guy out in front playing his guitar out on the corner. I come down here and use the library and I thank the ladies very much every time I use the computer so I can go online and check my emails about jobs, about anything. Building materials, because I want to build another tiny house. And I will. And I'll take and move it someplace. But there's a lot of people out there are a lot worse than I am on. And they've got reasons. I feel bad that the person that got stabbed down here at the transit center, I met that person in Barry at one time. I hope he makes it. I met a guy over here at the, uh, right in front of Shaw's tonight. He's a friend of that guy. He says, I hope he lives. I said, tonight and all the way up where I went and came back here, I prayed for that guy that he'll make it. And I told that guy I would pray for his friend because I'm not a perfect Christian. But I usually go to a mountaintop and I talk to God. Everybody's got a different way of doing it, okay? Or I go to Baptist church or other churches. I've been in church all my life. Even when I was in the National Guard, I'd go talk to a certain person. I trained a whole bunch of men to do things. Uh, diesel mechanic, everything. Everything the Army had, I could drive it, okay? But to get away from that, because I could go on all night. <laughs> if you can do something to help a homeless person, even if it's to buy him a cup of coffee because he's cold, don't buy him a beer. Buy him a cup of coffee, grab him a sandwich and pass it to him. The guy will thank you 100% over. Am I right? Yes. Or a girl will do the same thing because it's something they need. The food shelf is great, but the only problem I don't like about the food shelf, their bread is frozen. I can't keep it in my motel room in less than a week and it turns black mold. I threw two out today. I got evicted out of a motel in Montpelier, but that's another story in itself. I'm back on the street officially. But when I walked underneath, back and forth underneath in Barry City from Cumberland to Cumberland, and I had a thin coat, Montpelier gave me this coat. I got into City Hall. I got two that day. It was a donation thing from some of you people. This is my later one. I still got the heavy one. I thank whoever donated 100% over, believe me, because everything I had in my trailer, when black mold went through it, I lost all my clothing, my house trailer that I owned and paid for. 
and I had to walk away from that. And when my dad passed away, it was one of the hardest things for me because that was my best friend. I'd gone through a divorce with my ex after 45 years. And I had to buy a trailer, had to buy the land, but the fools who put the roof on didn't know what they were doing. And it leaked in and caused black mold. And it ruined a good $5,000 trailer. But community. do the community uh, thing. You need to take care of the people that are here. Take the people that are alive, keep them alive. Surprise them with a cup of coffee and a sandwich. I do it all the time in Barry. The other night, just for instance, I had five bucks left on me. I'm walking through Barry City, I see a sign out there, dollar special, rose day. I bought two dozen roses. I didn't have the money to take a blow, but I did it and I walked down to three places. People where I stopped to use the bathroom or to get a cup of coffee, told strange women, I said, okay, I'll use one, Domino's. I went in there. That almost took two dozen right there, the men, women that work in the Domino's and Barry. But I had four left. That went to Gypsy Mart. Because that's why I used the bathroom. I talked to those girls. I didn't, I said, this is just because you're hard working. Youth and this woman was heavy set. Then answered, what are you doing here? I said, I can't, how many girls are you going to do these? She says, uh, seven, eight, nine, something like that, I'll count. She came back over. I said, they're all different colors. Take these and pass them out. When they're gone, I would take the rest with me. But it made those girls' day, because they've been working hard. The guys looked at me like, what are you doing hitting all these young chicks, you know? <laughs> but I'm 70 years old, and I got a lot of life left in me. And I will fight to the bitter end to help anybody in this world that need it. Because I've seen Montpelier pull together, and I've seen Montpelier get us through floods. And I don't, my boat was only a rowboat, but it helped save somebody. And there were speedboats going up down Main Street, oh, everything. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I know Montpelier's a good town to start with. Barry, it's gone downhill a lot. Oh, yeah. And I owned land at what Barry, and I gave the ex the house there when I moved down, we split up. <laughs> I just wanted to say, do that if you have some help, and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you. Somehow I thought a lot of people here had something to offer, a lot of heads nodding. Um, does somebody else want to ask a question or offer an observation? Tori? Um, for anybody who's looking for housing, Bill Dolter and Lyndon Normando had a post on Front Porch Forum this morning that they have a small apartment downstairs in their house that they're running out. Um, so if you can get onto Front Porch Forum, um, give, give them a call. It's, it sounds like it's pretty simple. I think it's a bedroom and a, and a you say, what a sitting room. It was uh, for 950. Yep. I do think he might have mentioned you need a four wheel drive, but the best thing to do is to call the person because yeah. it might work for you. Yeah, and he said, he said, mm -hmm. um, he said it's good to have a four wheel drive. I've been up yeah. down that driveway before without a four wheel drive. Okay. It, 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 I didn't know where it was, was. that's why I mentioned that. Yeah, so yeah, it's it's very hard to find out. Way up, way up there. Yeah. Uh, Anything you know, under a thousand is going to count. Yeah, and, and it includes, I, I'm pretty sure it includes. Um, yeah. No, there's a problem homelessness. Um, our story is kind of like theirs. Um, it's it's just hard, you know. This is I'm an educator. I got a master's degree. Uh, I won't do my story like Gary, but <laughs> <laughs> um, my mom's estate got taken from me, from my, my family, whatever, the money, whatever. So I, I was homeless. I met her in the homeless, up in the hotel up in the theater. Um, but it, it's, it's really hard, um, not only with that, with the, the advice that economic services gave to me, was it correct? And it really kind of put me in a bind, so they really don't know the answers as well. Um, even their managers don't know the answer because they're waiting on the federal funding to come in to say, all right, this is that, this is this. Um, I've had a really hard time of getting correct answers from economic services. And the only way to do it is if you call them, you're on the phone for 12 hours. And not, not that's exactly, I'm talking at least three to four hours. And for one, if you don't have any electricity to charge your phone, then boom, you know, if you, don't even have internet, you know, it's just, so you have to go there, and if you don't have a 
you know, the buy ride thing in Montpelier is one of the best things I've ever seen. It really is. The, the, she gets around on it. I have a truck, I have my RV with my van that's a little but she walks a lot and I like to walk as well, but the my ride thing is a great program for Montpelier or anywhere else, you know. Um, it's just, there's so many issues with, with homelessness. It's not only Montpelier, it's, you know, well, you're obviously the United States, but you have to get it into your town. You know, you have to simplify it down into, all right, we're Montpelier. We're not, you know, Joe Small from Idaho. We need to think about people in Montpelier. You know, I know a lot of people don't, not in my backyard. That's, it's in your yard. And the only way to solve the problem is to get these, get people a stable house, because if you don't have a stable house, how can you work on your mental health? Or if you're a drug addict or an alcoholic, how can you even think about it? You can't challenge those challenges until you say, every night, I got a place to live. Believe it, I've slept in this shit out of my van. And it sucks. I can handle it. I'm bare grill, but she can't, you know? Or my dog can't. The reason I mentioned the uh, Northfield Street um, Habitat for Humanity project mm -hmm. is they solicit input. And, and it would be good if anybody can attend those hearings to emphasize the need for all kinds of low barrier uh, housing. They're scared if they speak up, they're going to be thrown out on the street. And, yes, it's, uh, and that is, that's one of the biggest problems, really. And, and it happens every single day. If the guy don't like your boom, so you know. I can see if, you know, you're dealing drugs and all that dumb shit. Yes, get them out of here. But they don't have enough education to even bring it up to someone. They don't even know how to go about the situation without, you know, it's just, it's, there's a lot of work to be had. It's all like that. There is, and like I say, it's going to be several years. Yep. Yep. Peter? 100%. I just want to make an announcement and a request. Some of you already know about this. But because of the stabbing um, last week, the transit center warming hours, which were between 5 o'clock in the afternoon and 8 o'clock uh, in the evening when people could go to the overflow shelter, but the transit center, is, it, that's not available anymore. Oh. So the churches are setting up uh, every night between 5 and 8, um, various churches are going to have a warming shelter. It's going to be staffed, but we need volunteers. Um, I've got a, a sign-up sheet where people, if they're willing to volunteer, um, you know, it would be great to volunteer for one a particular night uh, every week, but if you can only do certain night, a certain night, that would be fine as well. So I'm going to leave the, I've got these back here. So if, you, if people would sign up, I know some of you already know about, about this, but. And, and, and any questions about what I just said? No. Is there a schedule of which church is going to be when? No, the, this, the, the schedule is going to come every week. Okay. We'll, we'll, I'm, what I'm going to ask people to do the volunteer, put your name, your email, and your telephone number. So as soon as we know, uh, we, and possibly if, if there's a, if there's a, I should have made another column for what day would be good for you. To get, okay, you could put that in. But we don't know right now. It's just being set up. So which churches are going to be open when? Is my, was my question. I know. We, okay. it, it, just for people who are looking for them. They, as soon as it's set up, <laughs> the word will be put out. Okay. Should we do some posters? The, the, the place to, go, to find out, another way can tell you which churches. Uh, but Sam can tell you which churches. And we're, they're going to, I'm only trying to get volunteers. Okay. I'm not running the, the program. Okay. Can I ask? Can I ask you guys a question? Sure. There are dormitories at the top of the hill that are for sale at the college. Would would that solve any of the problems with a dorm room? As long as it has a, a fridge that you can that you can have at least you know a freezer. Oh, well, that makes sense. And then a place to cook. You know, just a simple two burner thing yeah. and a place to do the dishes. 
that's a lot better than a hotel room because in there, well, it would be more fun. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, luckily, I had my RV and I had a sold out there. So, yeah. But, you know, in a freezing globe, who wants to go out? I just didn't know if that would work for transitional housing. Yeah. Yeah, have they been trying to push the city to? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and dorm rooms are usually a hot place. Even if there was a communal you know, yes. kitchen. Yes. I don't know if these dorms have like kitchens and, you know, like dining house. house. I don't know. Yeah. But like a, totally. like a rooming house. Yeah, in my dorm room we had a good little kitchen you could use. And yeah. Everyone had their own room. Yeah, that would work. Something like even with a communal bathroom. Just put them on the table. Makes you feel normal again. Instead of, you know. And it would be a safe place to leave your stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You make it your home. Yeah. 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 You know, when you don't have like the security of having a home or having something that you would like to consider to be your abode, it becomes very really challenging. And you don't really put the energy into it to really make yourself feel at home. So that's always a constant struggle. And that's probably always something that you're going to be striving for. So, you know, it can definitely be part that's missing. Just get the, That's the main thing. thing. You have to have yes. a stable home before you can work on yourself. Yeah. Because if you don't, you're thinking about your state, your home. Yeah. And you know, yeah. do that. It's just very, very. That's the basic thing. Yeah. Is okay. Housing. I'm just all the rest curious to know what you guys might think because you know, of yeah. course not. You know, there's rules and stuff. You know, you can't. You know, you have to think that you're going to sit there and get everything paid for for your rest of. Time. You know, there's different programs and stuff. I understand that. And I understand there's a time to help someone and a time not to and just say, all right, we have to go through these steps and yeah. what's going on to help to better yourself. You know, there has to be a program where, okay, why are all these people in these hotels and, okay, what are you doing? Are you, are you trying to get a job? Are you in disability? Or are you working um, full time? Well, well, yes, I'm and you work. I, I, I get it. Yeah. We work as well. Yeah. And it's, you can't. You know the the housing. That's not the housing crisis is a whole different thing than than the homeless thing. I'm going to well, interrupt at this point. Unless somebody else. Has okay, that's fine. Thank you. Um, so I totally get the politics. I you know that we got to do something, but I haven't heard any proposals. I read the paper, every article about homelessness. I read it. I'm here. I have not heard any proposals coming from the state, from the city. Has, does anybody, has anybody heard you proposals? No, I, I have one. Um, <laughs> okay, so I don't, I don't know anybody personally that owns one of these homes, but there are several homes out there that they use as like Airbnb, for example, oh. short term. Yeah. You know, and, they, and there's no cap on it, number one. These people that own these homes can ask whatever amount they want, and then ask the person to leave, but why don't, have, why don't they have a vacancy room tax that those people that own those houses have to pay for every month that that I love that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. we have a cap Airbnb. In there. Yeah. Yeah. I see kids at these motels. There's yeah. no excuse for that. Yeah. And, and I get upset because when I, my son was brought up, we had the same apartment for 13 years. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I can't even imagine a moving a child to the motel. What's that going to teach Close. him about yeah. the goodness yeah. of people? I have another question for those of you who are employed and can't find a place. What would be an amount that you could afford to pay for rent? You're looking at a thousand bucks for two people, you know? Yeah. It's going to be a third, you know, third of your reason. Yeah, you know, a thousand a, a, a month. But I just saw one for like fifteen hundred dollars, and there's it's no electricity or anything like that. You have to deal with that. That's another three hundred. Yeah. You know. If you're talking a thousand yeah. total. So a thousand about total. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Eleven hundred at the okay. most for everything. Yep. You know? And it's yes, it's so really now, hard to find. To answer and, your question. I don't know of anything that's a concrete proposal for any kind of longer term housing at this point. Um, like I said earlier, uh, Habitat for Humanity is uh, considering proposals for housing. Uh, I'm not sure what they'll come up with in the end, but again, anything that would be talking about housing, 
would be probably three to four years out. Oh, yeah, there's a bill actually, uh, which is in uh, the Senate Appropriations Committee right now. Uh, if any of you, uh, which has a lot of, it's, it, it's an omnibus bill. Obviously, it's going to be hacked up and who knows what will come out of it. But uh, uh, I was at a meeting today at the Coalition Homelessness for Washington County, and Sue Minter, who is the director of Capstone, urged everybody and anyone who has in, any experience in homelessness, particularly people who are homeless or work with homeless, to, uh, to uh, email testimony based on your own experience, short, just a short piece, urging that this bill in some form be passed. And I'll see if I can. What is, what is the, book, the what bill again? I, 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 I should have brought the. It's excuse. promoting a lot. No, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an <laughs> omnibus. <laughs> it's a, a many faceted solution related to housing, homelessness, housing all the way from uh, temporary uh, emergency housing uh, to uh, more permanent housing. Uh, congregate housing to uh, a non-congregate housing and, a, and a, a pathway from one to the other. It would address the issue of the current hotel uh, motel program. It, 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 it's a big program. It's Is fine. there an it's, email group that you yeah, I, I, I've got like, You know, I want to talk to you guys. What, what the key? The same shit. You like appropriation. Now there's another thing that's happening is we're having yeah, elections here. Excuse me. We're having elections in Montpelier, and so I would pick people that you know to be sympathetic to this situation, because uh, if something's to be done in Montpelier, city council has to be on board with it. So uh, that's another approach in addition to going to the various developments and giving your input on that. Um, for those who don't vote, um, I think they're going to have to rely on us. <laughs> for those who don't Sorry. Vote, too. <laughs> well, but, but there are people who don't have a residency here. So that, you know. Oh, OK. We, we've abolished that now? Oh, then vote, vote, vote. <laughs> Task force, and I know this is going to make people cringe, but we still do it. The homelessness task force has hired some consultants to actually come up with an actionable plan Doesn't to do cringe. something in Montpelier. That is supposed to be presented to the city council sometime in March, yeah. and the homelessness task force should hear it first. And those meetings are open to the public. They are. Where are they listed? Um, <coughs> on the city <coughs> website, which probably doesn't help if you're a volunteer. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a centralized email that we could use um, yeah, that's all that people could, could contact. Well, the Homelessness Task Force is 1130 in City Hall um, uh, every other week, uh, starting March 1st, March 15th. Right. And, and several members, Matt, there's a bunch of us here. What um, time is that? 1130 uh, in, the in the morning till, till about 1. In, at, at, at the main city hall. At city hall in the main in the main. Uh, okay. And if you go if you go on the city website, there's a um, there's a list of we wanted to is navigate to agenda, agendas agendas and minutes and and uh, that lists all of the What's committees, including the homelessness task force, who all set the zoom link. Yeah. Can you do you have access to the website? Yes, I can get a hold. Yes. Okay. So the city's website, it's a little, it's a little kludgy, but it does, yeah. it has a button. If you scroll down, there's something that says agendas and minutes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, and minutes you the, click the, on the that, it gets you to all the, yeah. the listing of all the, the committee meetings. <coughs> you can find the homelessness task force. You can find city council. They'll give you the agenda. Yes, um, that's cool. The um, agenda for this next meeting is all three of the candidates for mayor are coming to talk oh, to us about yeah. their uh, ideas about homelessness. Yep. And that's the day after tomorrow. Yep. That's right. Yep. Yep. 11 30. And, and just for the record, at the mayoral candidate meeting today, um, there was talk about limiting Airbnbs, um, particularly in non owner occupied houses. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it'll be an uphill fight, but I think it's a good one to fight. 
there uh, some other regions that have done that with some success. Oh, I did like more. New Orleans. Yeah, I don't know a ton about it, but I know it's been done. Do you know where? Mary? Uh, I, I would really like to promote tiny houses more. And I feel like, if, you know, there's a possibility that I could really work towards that if um, other people could join in and if I could see if I could get some funding. I do have building experience. And I have lived in a, it was an ex-fishing shanty. <laughs> <laughs> That's tiny. Yeah, it was, it was 10 by 7, but you know, wow. a 16-foot mold, tiny house, you know, I, I think this is really key because a person could get started in it before, and then when they move on, then it's free for somebody else, or there's all kinds of options, you know, with something like that. And I, I really would like to um, venture into that if I knew more people that were interested and wanted to try to get some funding for that. Do well, you know what we have another person? Five that? minutes. I agree with you. Uh, I just talked to him. Mm -hmm. I agree with you on the tiny house thing because they used them for uh, what was it? Uh, the one way down south in New Orleans. They put temporary housing on one show. Then they sold them. The federal government made so many of them. They didn't use them, and they started to mold because yeah. they were there. Well, they they with tiny houses, you can have a bedroom, a kitchen, right. and a living room. It's all you basically need, and a bathroom. And it's very simple to put together. Yeah. You're mentioning the floods made me think of why don't we do something like uh, Vermont Strong for Montpelier Strong? Yeah, we did. Right. I was I was there volunteering for the flood yeah. to help build the road. I think that went uh, over well. well. I wasn't there. Yeah, I well, helped the for the road back to well because it was this yeah. wide. But I wasn't here for that. But I, I remember. I think that went over really well. The Vermont Strong, and so oh, yes. we could have strong. a fundraiser for Montpelier. Yeah. But the other question I had was, I know this is Mount Prater, but up in Berlin a few years ago, they tore down a whole row of houses yeah. and, and sold the lumber because they were going to build some housing up there and it's still just sitting there. And that's probably 10 years ago. Yeah, we've got about two or three minutes left. Is there anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak? Uh, yeah. Nat, you want to say something? Well, Paige, let, let, me, let, let Nat yeah. have a... Can I respond to what I'm hearing? Please. Uh, it really concerns me deeply to hear you say that you haven't heard of a single proposal that would deal with this with this tangled and complicated issue. Am I hearing you correctly? I, I, there are, I've read um, high in the sky proposals. I haven't seen anything serious in the paper. Okay, now I'm going to go into. Uh, I'm going to make a comment that I haven't researched. It's a hunch. I'm going to share a hunch. I think that the various uh, jurisdictions that handle government are waiting for the state to act, are waiting for the communities to act, are waiting for the regional. Everybody's waiting for somebody to act because nobody wants nobody wants to ta nobody wants to be the guy that comes in and says your taxes go up ten percent your taxes go up fifteen percent so th that's my hunch is that there there's a tug of war going on between the state and the local governments and all the other jurisdictions in between to see who's going to pay for this. But they may be wrong. I think there's a lot of truth to what you're saying, sir. The, 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 the critical thing I'm hearing tonight is we're, we're finally hearing from people who have had um, are having the experience of being unhoused in central Vermont. And I think that's incredibly valuable, particularly given that we have so many members of the Homelessness Task Force here. If you choose to attend those meetings, they're on Zoom, in addition to being in person. And at the very opening, people introduce themselves, and then the next thing is public comment. So there's an opportunity to make a comment. It'll be limited in time, because there are time constraints generally. But that's an excellent way of being heard, and maybe not being quite as exposed as you might be in another circumstance. So I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. I think it's a wonderful turnout, and I think we had a great 
conversation that had some depth to it. Uh, yeah.